I'm Oded Noam, I'm chief architect at OBS. Um, a little bit of background about myself, I'm, I've been a developer and systems architect for the uh, past 25 years or so. Um, before joining OBS as the chief architect, I was uh, head of blockchain architecture at uh, Kik Interactive. So um, I've had some experience with actually playing with a lot of platforms and deploying um, a token economy uh, on a couple, on Ethereum and Stellar. And uh, today I'm going to talk about uh, blockchain virtualization, uh, which is uh, something, um, uh, the, the next step uh, in ev the evolution of how the uh, dApps interact with the uh, platform. So before I do, uh, um, let me take you back about 20 years to the dot-com era. Uh, for those of you who uh, weren't there or just don't remember, uh, so, uh, back then, um, at the time, I was an, uh, a junior engineer at a web startup, and um, startups uh, apparently were very similar to how they operate today, uh, but at the time, we had about uh, 10 people, most of them developers, uh, and we got some seed funding, uh, but then a large part of this funding had to go to actually maintaining our own infrastructure. And we had, uh, in a small office, we had a server room, and we had rack-mounted web servers and database servers, and we had UPS systems, and uh, routers, and firewalls, and load balancers, and all that. And of course, we also had a full-time IT guy to do the administration of all these systems. And for, for a small startup, uh, that was a very heavy burden. And of course, that's not how startups are done today. And a large part of that is the introduction of virtualization to the hosting uh, uh, technologies of, of centralized application. So if we look at centralized backends, um, about 20 years ago, before uh, virtualization was introduced, uh, a developer had the choice between using a private or a public uh, infrastructure. So if they chose to have their dedicated private infrastructure, then um, they would have to pay the high costs of maintaining such infrastructure, but they, they would have a production-ready system uh, with high performance and high levels of security um, at, at a very high cost. Now, their only other option was to go for a, a shared infrastructure. So that's something that's uh, not that common today, but it's basically uh, a very large managed system uh, where a lot of apps can host uh, a lot of apps can host um, together on a single server, and that's very cheap and very easy to set up. But it's uh, uh, very unfit for uh, scaling up and for production. So, uh, for one, if another app running on the same server suddenly gets a lot of traffic, then uh, your application uh, would slow down and uh, um, data security is a problem because there are other people on your system, on your database, on your uh, web server, so it's very hard to protect your uh, private data. Um, but these were the only options, and uh, then came virtualization technologies and radically changed the whole way this world works. And that's what we call today cloud computing. So. As you probably know, if uh, you're setting up a web startup today, you have uh, the ability to set up an entire, um, entire stack of web servers, uh, database servers, load balancers, firewalls, all that. You could do that in minutes over a cloud platform. Uh, it's very easy to set up. Uh, it's actually very cheap to set up. Uh, a lot of cloud platforms even provide you with the first few servers for free. And this is similar to your uh, scaling up production system. It simply scales up as you go along. So uh, besides the difference in cost, what it actually did to the ecosystem of startups is that it made it really simple, really cheap, and really fast to experiment. So an entrepreneur today doesn't need to raise few uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars and purchase servers and uh, UPS systems and all that. 
just to try something out. It's really easy to, to try, maybe fail, maybe succeed, maybe change, and iterate with that. So there's some, um, some external effects that really changed how the ecosystem works. Um, and now going back to our world of decentralized blockchain-based backends, we're basically at the same place that the uh, uh, web, centralized web 2.0 industry was 20 years ago. A developer today has the choice between setting up their own dedicated blockchain infrastructure or going joining a shared one. So if we look a little bit uh, into these choices, um, basically after Bitcoin, anybody who had their own DAP uh, knew that they could fork Bitcoin or maybe one of the platforms that uh, came after that. Uh, a lot of people are forking Stellar, for example. We did that at Kik. Um, but a lot of them underestimate how hard it is to actually maintain a, a blockchain. Because it's not only about forking the code base, right? You need to have a sufficiently decentralized network of independent validators. Now that's a lot of big words, but what does it even mean to have a sufficiently decentralized network of independent validators? It means that you need to have people who are uh, trustworthy enough to be validators on your network, and they need to be technically capable of securing a node on a blockchain. So they need to be able to do security audits, and they need to uh, know your code, and they need to, uh, to review changes to the code and changes to the protocol and participate in public debates about changes to the protocol. And th that's quite hard. There, there aren't a lot of people who can do that. But again, we need to set up a sufficiently decentralized network of validators. So, so we actually need a lot of people to participate in that. And that's very, very hard to set up. Now, and you don't only need to set it, that up, you actually need this community to be active enough even if the use of the application declines or the uh, token valuation drops or maybe just something more interesting came along. Because we have to remember, once this community of validators, if, if they lose interest, then your app doesn't have a platform to run on. And that's a huge risk for anybody developing an app. And I don't know of a lot of apps that can solve that problem on their own. Now, of course, you don't, need, you don't always have to solve it on your own. If we can band together a lot of apps and set up uh, a platform together, that would get us um, quite a bit ahead. And that's where Ethereum came to the rescue and made it a lot easier for dApps to deploy. You use a smart contract on a general purpose blockchain as the backend for your app. That's really much, much easier than setting up your own blockchain and maintaining it. But then it also is a shared platform and there are a lot of inherent problems with, with having uh, a shared platform. So uh, on Ethereum and also on uh, other shared platforms such as EOS and others, uh, Essentially, everybody are sharing the blocks. So uh, one problem is that if there's a surge in the demand for one app, for another app, then my app is going to suffer from that. It's going to uh, process its transactions slower. And uh, on Ethereum, uh, for example, where the fees are determined in free market, I'm also going to have to pay uh, much higher fees. So that's one problem. Uh, speaking about fees on Ethereum, Ethereum also would uh, force me to uh, use two tokens, because usually I have my own token for the app, but now I need my users to hold also Ether. And that's also quite a problem. Uh, back when I was at uh, Kik, when we deployed Kin, our token, on, uh, uh, on Ethereum, we actually had to send Ether to our users so that they can send transaction in Kin. And that was not only expensive, it was actually quite difficult to do that in such a way that they cannot steal the Ether. So th that was a challenge. Uh, but then there's a whole other challenge that 
um, a lot of people are not aware of, and that is uh, that the governance is actually determined by the underlying protocol. So um, when we see a few cases where it really uh, comes out very boldly. Uh, basically, when you deploy your uh, backend as a smart contract on top of a shared infrastructure, um, in the hard governance decisions that you might need to make, uh, the decision makers will be the stakeholders of the underlying platform. So we can see that in a few cases on Ethereum where um, people needed, uh, um, well, for example, Parity Wallet uh, locked out a uh, few, well, a lot of millions of dollars in deleted smart contracts, and they actually uh, needed the Ethereum Foundation to adopt an, a protocol change in order to release that, and that was rejected, and it didn't happen. And it also happens on EOS. So there, we, we saw a couple of examples last month of dApps that had bugs in their uh, smart contracts and wanted to replace the smart contracts and they then need to appeal uh, to a committee of uh, EOS block producers. Now, these block producers, they were elected with EOS stake. So it's basically the stake of another token that is determining uh, the critical governance decisions of your economy. And that's a big risk. Uh, so as you probably could have guessed by now, I believe that the next step in the evolution of uh, general purpose blockchain technologies is virtualization, just like we had with uh, centralized systems. So um, that's a very fundamental, uh, um, uh, a very fundamental concept uh, in ORBS. Uh, so uh, in ORBS and uh, also other platforms are uh, uh, also doing that. Uh, we have a single platform, a single network of validators, and each of them is participating in uh, validating all of the virtual chains. But the virtual chains are separate and isolated from each other. So uh, we're actually capable of adding more and more virtual chains on the same set of validators. So that we can add infinite number of, uh, of virtual chains, so we do that, we have a virtual chain per dApp. Now, every dApp has its own dedicated ledger. It has its own blocks. It has a guaranteed block rate and guaranteed block size. Now, the, this single dApp is the only user of these blocks. So once we know the block size and block rate, it actually has uh, guaranteed throughput. So for those of us who are coming from blockchain development, thinking about guaranteed throughput, that's a bit mind-blowing. But for people coming from cloud development, well, of course you need to have guaranteed throughput. I mean, how can you develop an app without having guaranteed throughput? Now, we know the uh, block size, we know the block rate, we can also know in advance the costs of operating that virtual chain. And we can actually budget that. We can even pay for that in advance. So if somebody pays for, uh, the, uh, for the allocation of the virtual chain in advance, we don't actually have to uh, collect transaction fees. Transaction fees could work for some applications, but not for all. So we can set up a virtual chain where there are no transaction fees. Of course, it is your virtual chain. If you want, you can set your own native token. You can set up transaction fees in that token if that fits you. That's up to you. Now, another thing we can do once we have isolated virtual chains is that you can have your own on-chain governance. So that if you need to have a hard fork and uh, bail out users who had their uh, funds stolen because of a, a bug to a smart contract, and these things happen, they happen on Ethereum, well, now you can do that with the uh, governance body that decides upon that is whoever you set up to be the governance body. And it could be whatever on-chain governance scheme that you want to set up. As long as you can code that on-chain governance scheme as a smart contract, that would be the governance of your virtual chain. Now, that has a lot of promise. It does sound like 
solves a lot of problems. I'm sure the uh, uh, user community of uh, the parity multisig wallet would be really happy to have that. But if we look at the big picture, it also has some promise. Uh, uh, for me, it always seems that uh, the whole area of on-chain governance is currently at a bit of a primitive state. We haven't, I mean, blockchain exists for a bit less than 10 years, and we haven't seen a lot of forms of governance. Um, and that's partly because it's, it hasn't been a long time, but it's also because it's really an, a very inflexible part of setting up a blockchain. It's probably the, the part that is hardest to change. It's the most inflexible part. And uh, by having this ability to set up virtual chains, each with their own uh, on-chain governance scheme, and some flexibility to replace schemes, I believe just having this type of um, ability to, to quickly change the governance would enable us to, uh, I would say, to turbocharge the evolutionary process of getting to better on-chain governance schemes. So I believe this has a lot of promise in just advancing this industry. Um, so, oh, um, sorry, it's, uh, yeah, okay. Uh, so you get all that, you get all that for a uh, very low cost. Uh, you don't need to set up your own network uh, of uh, uh, sufficiently decentralized network of uh, independent uh, validators. Uh, you don't need to make sure that that network can sustain. Uh, you don't need to worry as much about security of the protocol and changes and, and so on uh, because the infrastructure is taken care of. Um, and setting up a virtual chain is really a very fast and easy process. So hopefully it's as fast as setting up a server on AWS. Um, so that has a lot of potential in, uh, in expediting how, uh, how startups are capable of trial and error, of experimenting. So this is Orbs. Orbs is a... Um, OBS is developing um, a platform for uh, um, large-scale uh, consumer apps, mostly. Um, it's all built around the concept of, uh, of virtual blockchains. So it's very elastic, it's very scalable. Um, our um, reference implementation is capable of uh, reaching thousands of TPS per virtual chain, but the important part is that the virtual chains are completely isolated from each other. So we have that performance for every virtual chain and we can have any number of virtual chains and, each of, and the performance will not be affected as you have more and more chains. Um, so we do that. Uh, we support very flexible uh, uh, SDK for smart contracts in multiple languages. Um, and uh, the operation costs are, uh, are very low and predictable. Uh, now, we do all that um, uh, in, in conjunction with working on Ethereum. So uh, most of the users currently on Orbs are actually uh, issuing their token on Ethereum because Ethereum has the right ecosystem for issuing a token. It's really easy to connect an ESC20 to exchanges and to uh, uh, multi-sig wallets and hardware wallets and all that. But, you, but it's just not um, practical today to connect as a backend of a consumer app. So you s they, they set up their token on Ethereum and they use Orbs as the backend for the application and we have an autonomous swap between the two systems. Uh, so uh, that's Orbs. Um, basically, I'm out of time. So uh, thank you.